one. Welcome everyone. It's 4 p.m. and I'm calling the December monthly meeting of the Community Oversight Board to order. I will start with the reading of the appeal statement. Pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. We'll take a uh, roll here. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Present. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davis, I don't think uh, can join us until a bit later. Uh, Ms. Davis, are you on? Mr. Goddard. Mr. Goddard, are you there? I'm here, just joined, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hildreth. Mr. Hughes. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Holloway? Here. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Dr. Lewis? Ms. Ross? Present. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Sweeney? I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. And Mr. Witzel? Here. Thank you. I'll kick it over to Mr. Pinkley for the electronic meeting statement. Thank you, Chair Martinez. Uh, just real quickly, uh, we are able to meet today electronically under Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 65, which suspends the in-person quorum requirements. Uh, just as a reminder for the board members, uh, unless called by your name by Chair Martinez, please identify yourself, uh, just to keep the record clear for those watching at home. Uh, but to proceed today, we just need a motion, a second, and an affirmative vote. Uh, that we are meeting electronically to conduct essential business and doing so electronically to protect the safety and wealth, welfare of Tennesseans. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion. This is going to be used that um, we have the aforementioned uh, motion take. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Is there a second? Second. This is Ms. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Sweeney, I think. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, I'll do a roll call vote here. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Davis, I don't think is here yet. Um, Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Not here. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Hi. Dr. Lewis. I am here. Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Ms. Ross. Hi. Mr. Sweeney. Hi. And Mr. Witzel. Hi. Right. I vote as well. Thank you. Um, next is the approval of the minutes. Um, if everyone's had a chance to review them, I'll take a motion to approve. I so move, Hildreth. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. This is Brenda Ross, I second. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Any focus discussion on the minutes, any corrections that need to be made? There are none. I will take another roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Davis, I don't think is here. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. 
Mr. Hughes. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And Mr. Witzel. Aye. I vote aye as well. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief here in the chair remarks since we have some guests today and, and we should get to them in time. Um, so this is the last meeting of the year and I, I want to thank everyone for the time that you've dedicated to, to making sure that the COB has been successful this year. You know, many of us haven't seen each other in person since our last in-person meeting, which was in February, I think. So, you know, we've all been adjusting to this weird new reality that we're in. But I, I want to especially thank Dr. Hildreth and Director Fitchard for their work on the MOU negotiations. Now, last week, the executive committee voted to approve the new MOU, and uh, I believe everyone has signed it, and it's been filed with the clerk. Um, the executive committee also discussed proposed legislation regarding the use of license plate readers by law enforcement in Nashville and the policy recommendations from the Policing Policy Commission, which directly involved this, the COB and MNCO. So I hope you had time to read the uh, memo I sent along with the proposed legislation and the editorial by Mr. Hayes, who I believe is also joining us today. Um, as we look forward to the, the third year, our third year as a board, I'm, I'm looking forward to continue seeing this new MOU uh, in action, freeing us, the board, from having to discuss, you know, all this inadequate access to records. So I also want to make sure that the COB takes a more active role in policy issues involving law enforcement in our community. Um, many of us have expressed the need to be at the table from the moment policies are proposed to the time they're enacted or not enacted. Uh, and I want to make sure that in the coming months, uh, we're definitely, you know, not lagging behind, not being the last ones to know, uh, and, you know, making sure that we're at the table from the beginning. Um, so thank you very much again, and I'll pass it to Director Fitcher for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Chair Martinez. Um, so I'm going to go through my report because um, I know that we have guests, and then I'll just take uh, questions at the end. Um, but thank you. Um, so the executive summary is we're still telecommuting the office, the COB office, um, the MNCO. We're still telecommuting, especially since the numbers have seemed to increase um, significantly in the last two weeks. Um, so. Um, we have decided to do um, all of our investigations and our public content contact on um, through the investigations to do those um, on um, via the telephone or um, via online. Um, we were able to get our video equipment installed, and so we're waiting on some training on how to work that equipment so that whenever we are able to have in-person investigations um, or interviews, we can do that in the office. We are still waiting for the investigator position to be filled um, and to be released. There's a hiring freeze still. Um, I believe that that may um, change um, in the next few months, but until that time, the investigator position that we have remains unfilled. We continued as a staff to um, participate in trainings through webinars that have been offered um, and some of those topics are criminal justice, racial and equal justice, diversity and inclusion, policing reform, and social justice issues. We have taken in one complaint um, since our last board meeting in November, um, and we continue to have multiple non-complaint calls for service. Um, most of those calls are referred um, to the correct agencies, and they are um, mostly dealing with um, various um, services that um, a person may may not be um, getting the kind of service that they want through agencies or sometimes it's just to find out about our office. Um, we did a holiday card campaign so everyone should be getting a holiday card in the mail. Um, we have our community liaison, Brenty Thompson, she created some specially designed cards um, Assistant Director Clausey um, thought of having a um, 
holiday card giveaway to a particular agency and he chose the Nashville General Hospital. Um, and so he wanted to thank them. We wanted to thank them for their hard work and dedication to the community during the national COVID pan pandemic. And so they, um, each one of the departments will receive a holiday card from us. And we're very proud of that and the work that they've done as well. Um, and so we're continuing to work on educational outreach endeavors to make the public aware of the services that we offer, um, specifically around how to file complaints, the process, and the difference between administrative and criminal investigations. We also, we also have worked on making certain that we're creating some documentation and some, some information to give to the police department um, so that officers know what the process is, something that they can have and keep in their similar to like a business card type of situation where they can be informed of the process. What I heard from um, some police officers was that they didn't really understand the process. And so we want to make certain that we are providing them enough information so that as they, if in fact they have a complaint um, lodged against them, that they would know what the process was and that they wouldn't have, you know, to worry um, of unanswered questions. So we are still working towards that. The MNCO research analysts are working diligently on the report that was initiated by the NAACP regarding the hiring procedures of the Metropolitan National Police Department. I think they start their first um, interviewing process with Metro with the police department tomorrow um, to start diving into um, the research in that and understanding the procedures that MNPD go through as they um, go through their hiring procedures. Um, I want to walk you a little bit through the MMPD in custody death. Um, on Thursday, December the 3rd, um, the, the entire MNCO investigative staff received a Department of Emergency Communication notification that came in around 11.55 p.m. Um, and in that notification, it indicated that a taser deployment and a subject was in custody, and that's basically all it said. Um, and so at 2.40 a.m., I received a call from Deputy Chief Mike Hagar regarding the in-custody death. Um, he gave me a brief update, and he told me that um, Captain Jason Starling, who was the field commander, would give me a call to brief me on more um, information. Um, Captain Starling um, sent out a message through DEC for me to give him a call. And I called him around 2.55 a.m. and he briefed me on some of the details of the incident. Um, I also at that moment contacted um, Director Chris Clausey to give him an update on the situation. Um, and then I decided to go to the scene um, and I arrived at 3.55 a.m. And when I got there, I was briefed by Captain Starling once again. Um, when I got there, the scene was preserved. Um, the TBI agents had appeared um, and they took over the scene. Um, I stayed there until I was briefed by the TBI agent in charge, and that was Agent Winkler. At 11.30 um, that following, like later on that morning, I got a call from um, Captain Starlin who extended an invitation for myself and um, A.D. Clausey to view the body camera footage of the incident. The incident had occurred in 800 block of West Sharp Avenue, um, and that is where Mr. Larry Boyd was taken into custody, and then um, he was pronounced dead upon his arrival at Nashville General Hospital. Um, so we arrived at MMPD headquarters at 1 o'clock, and we viewed the body worn footage from multiple cameras and angles. Um, the case is now in the hands of the TBI. And um, in order for us to get updates, we would have to go through the DEA's office to get those updates. And so um, we also have received a call from the agent in charge, Winkler, to give us more information um, later on that morning. And so that information is part of an investigation. And so we won't be able to talk about the specifics of it. Um, I will tell you that um, around, I think it was on the 8th that I received a call from MMPD regarding inquiries about the incident um, from the media uh, related to the death of Mr. Larry Boyd. Um, they told me that they were going to show the body camera footage to representatives of the media 
Um, my question to them was, have they shown the information to the family of Mr. Larry Boyd before showing it to the public? Um, and I thought that that, in my opinion, was the most respectful way to do things, um, to show the next of kin and make certain that they had the opportunity to view this and not the, um, the first indication that they have is when the public views it. Um, they, what I was told was that they were going to check and see if that had happened. Um, and that was my suggestion that they do that. And then, um, they called me back a few days later and told me that the family had in fact, um, viewed the, viewed the body camera footage, um, and that they were moving forward with, um, meeting with the media to show them, um, the, the footage that they had available. Um, so. That happened on the 10th, I believe, is when the media was notified or was allowed to view the video footage. Um, and so Director, I'm sorry, Chair Martinez just talked about the um, MOU. We got that signed on or approved on the 11th, and then it was um, sent to the sent to the um, Metro clerk and filed on the 14th. Um, and so I just wanted to give a special thanks to board member Phyllis Hildreth, who facilitated the negotiation of that draft with myself and the negotiation team. Um, and also thank the staff members who helped with the MOU language. Um, a special thanks to A.D. Clausey and Todd Pinkley, our um, legal advisor. And so and I'm going to wrap this up. And this has been a tremendous year. We've expended, experienced a tremendous year. 2020 has, without a doubt, shaped how we will move forward in the years to come. Um, the, the staff have worked hard and persevered through a natural disaster, a pandemic, multiple leadership changes, um, board member changes and roll-offs, numerous challenges within our city, um, in our nation as well. Um, and I think it's been a year of lots of intensity, uncertainty, um, adversity and reckoning. And so I'd like to thank the board for their leadership I know that each board member has sacrificed a lot to, to pour into this and to keep this agency up and running um, and to give us their support um, as, as well as working. Some of you work full-time jobs. And so we also wanna thank, I do um, wanna thank the, the many community members who stood with us, who called and checked in and who stood with us in solidarity through this year. Um, and also who helped hold us accountable to the mission of the agency. And I just wanted to let them know how appreciative uh, I am of their support, um, that we thank you, we hear you, we see you, and that we're here because of you. And that's all I have, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Any questions about the executive director's report? Dr. Lewis? Dr. Lewis, are you there? Any other questions? Yeah, Officer Holloway, um, I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Holloway. The uh, hiring procedure, talking about opening up uh, applicants for uh, new employees for the uh, police department, and um, I think I that was in the discuss on with a citizen uh, just last week, and uh, I think the Department of Force Patrol was short by 200 officers, um, and I saw that when I did the ride around through the community academy that we are very short in patrol and responding to calls because we don't have enough personnel. So what is the budget, uh, is the budget is set to approve to do two or three classes before the next budget come in in June or what? Do you have an idea? No, I know that there's a class um, that is either finishing up training or we'll begin training. I, I don't know for certain. I don't have an answer for you for that, Mr. Holloway, but I can find out. 
Um, Mr. Lara, I'm sorry, Captain Lara's on the line. He may know if there's a training class and if there's going to be more than one um, before the budget year is over. Well, I would like to ask Captain Lara a question, if I may. Yes, sir, go ahead. When are the police department going to start making the police department reflect the community? We need more blacks in the classes, you know, looking at some of the people in the at, at, at the academy, you look like you own hell by one or two in the class. No, no. We need to start having the police department reflect the community. Absolutely. That's a great question. And I'll tell you that the, the Chief Drake is really revamping our um, our our uh, outreach and, and really the the background recruiting the recruiting unit has been revamped so that we can start reaching more minorities um and again he's already started with our leadership uh, i don't know if you've seen any of the uh the current uh media releases where he has really changed the the look of our of our upper leadership, our executive staff, we have two, uh, an, another female, as well as two more African Americans that have joined the uh, the deputy chief ranks, uh, as well as he's named some a new a new uh, uh, captain who was a female and another captain who's African American. So we're working our way through this. Um, I know that we have a class that should be graduating, I believe, in March. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many other classes we're going to have, but I can get that information. Uh, but I want you to let you know that we are working on, on it uh, again with the new revamped and, and we're trying to change the way that we recruit so that we can re reach those minorities and, and, and those in the females and, and you know, African-American, Hispanics, so that we do better. Our... Okay, let me say this right here and then I'll be finished. I don't like to worry minority because blacks get hidden in the crowd of white females, Hispanic, and like what I said, I like for the the police department to reflect the community. Whatever percentage of blacks is in the community, 24, 28 percent, that's what I like to see the police department reflect. And you use minority, that's an escape goal. And, uh, and that leads the blacks out. Okay. Sir, completely understand. And uh, and again, I will get back with uh, with the chief and as well as those in the in the recruitment uh unit and see what we're doing. Um, but again, I know that we are trying to focus on getting uh, more people from different backgrounds and cultures um, so that we can mirror our, our, our community as much as possible. Uh, we're working on it. We're not anywhere where, any, where we need to be, and the chief has made that clear, but we are working towards it. And I will, uh, I will get back to you on that and, and really see if I can get you some specific information on what we're doing, as well as anything uh, to do with how many classes are going to be coming before the next budget year. Thank you, sir, and I'm, I'll be checking on that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Lara, and thank you, Mr. Holloway. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch, you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question very specifically for um, the executive director, but before I get into that, um, chair and our board members, I do have a concern and a point of order. Um, that that conversation between Captain Laura and uh, Laura and I was a Holloway was a very fruitful one. And as a community member, I feel like I learned a lot just through that minor exchange. But I'm just curious about how we can maintain uh, the board um, and the opinion of the board members during these conversations and really guard against anyone just kind of coming in that is a non-board member and lending us their opinion. I think we can build out space, but I wanted to talk about that point of order first. Uh, but my comment was, I mean, my question rather uh, to Executive Director Fitcher is, what are the non-complaint calls that we are receiving? Uh, I think that that's a beautiful thing and it shows like community members are reaching out to us for information and further oversight. But I'm just curious about like, what's the feel of those calls? What are the majority of those calls about, if we know? Yeah, sure. A lot of those calls are for other departments. So we've gotten a call about, um, we had one call where a gentleman said that there was someone um, on what he said was Metro property. Um, he said there was um, some people who were experiencing homeless insecurity um, camping out on some property. 
Um, so he wanted to um, find out what we could do about it. Um, we also had a call, we've had calls um, regarding, um, you know, they just called the wrong department. You know, they may call for oversight and it could be for public works that their trash didn't get picked up. Um, and so, um, or we've had calls that were um, actually um, calls that came in that they might have wanted to make a complaint, but it wasn't for our department. For instance, we had a call for an attorney, I mean, for a, a citizen who had a problem with their personal attorney. Um, and they wanted to know, you know, what we could do about it. And so those are the types of calls because, of course, we, you know, we are um, in the directory as community oversight. And this is, um, in the, you know, it seems like a community issue or problem. And they just need to be redirected to the right agency who can handle their, um, their specific issue. Oh, I think that's beautiful. Okay. Uh, and then, like, that leaves me curious about how we can just also understand those calls and, like, why they're coming to us and what information we can be gaining. I think that's a beautiful thing. And then my last question is around, uh, you had mentioned something about um, officer materials, um, which I think is a great idea. I'm just, I'm curious on if those officer materials will look like our materials also meant for civilians. Um, and then I'm also curious if there's a possible way we can make sure like almost like every household, at least the majority of people in Nashville also have something that they can look at when it refers to as um, the process of the board. And I'm thinking about um, something like a mailer or something like tangible um, in their hands. So I'm just curious about what those things look like for you or what you think those things could look like. Yeah, sure. We do have, um, we have a brochure that I think, you know, we haven't mailed it out. Um, just because, you know, usually I give them out when we have a community event or something like that. But we have a brochure with the procedure on. I think the one for the officer and what we were talking about and what I had gained from officers was that they didn't know like the specific investigative process. So like if they are the, um, if they're the, the person um, who's been, um, you know, uh, th that the complaint is against, that they didn't know what the process was. like even though it's kind of spelled out in maybe, it's not necessarily in the policy and maybe that's where they should find it. And so that's something that we need to talk with, with um, I think Deputy Chief Hager, whether we should put it in the, specifically in MMPD's policies in their manual, um, it's, it's kind of laid out in the MOU, right? The investigative and intake steps. But what we were thinking about is something that was um, small that they could keep in their um, badge holder, like who do you call if you get a comp if a complaint is lodged against you and what the steps are and things like that? It would be pretty um, specific and you know not a whole lot of information. But on a, on a larger scale, I think that ultimately um, it should be in their manual um, so that they know what the steps are and what to expect. Um, so those are my you know those are the two ideas that we have. But I think that, um, I've worked with com the community liaison, uh, Ms. Thompson. And she's created an infographic that we were still working on to present to the police department um, so that they can get out in their roll call trainings. But as for the community, the community wide, we do have a brochure. We just haven't um, thought about mailing it out to everyone. But that's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Just do a quick time check here. Um, I know Council Member Stiles was only going to be able to make it through from 4.30 to 5, so I'm not sure if she's on the line yet. Doesn't look like it. And if she isn't, we can keep with the questions. Uh, so, Dr. Lewis. Hey, I figured out how to unmute. Um, I wanted to go back to the in custody desk and just make sure that everyone is aware that autopsy reports are a matter of public record in Tennessee. It probably will take 10 to 16 weeks for that one to be done. So you don't have to rely on the DA's office for that portion of the examination. And then I just wanted to say it's so encouraging to hear how that investigation went compared to ones in the past which actually were non-existent because we were not called and not permitted to go on scene. You know, it took 
two years and a new chief, but it really sounds like things have done just about a 180, and that, that really gives me some hope for this. I think I'm near the end of my tenure on the board, but that, that's kind of a good way to go out. So thanks, everybody. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Is Council Member Stiles, are you on the line yet? I thought I, I am. Her. Good afternoon. Hi, Council Member Stiles. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you for having me. I'll have pass it on to you uh, to talk about the proposed uh, legislation. Wonderful. Thank you. So my bill is BL 2020-494. It has been created to deal with excessive drag racing and reckless driving. I have also added the component utilizing uh, license plate readers that if anyone is going in excess of 70 miles per hour, it will trigger, of course, the excessive speeding, but it will also run the plate to check and see if it is a stolen plate or if it is a stolen vehicle. And so, I wanted to introduce a usage of LPRs that was narrow in focus because I know that there is concern about their use. And I have proposed a six month pilot where at the fifth month we would review the data to see if they have been effective. It would also allow for monitoring the audit controls that are built into the system. So you can see how you cannot use it for surveillance um, or for any privacy concerns really. So uh, that is the bill amended as it stands now. And non-offender data is only held for 30 days and it is deleted. And it is not touched at all if it is not needed uh, for any prosecutorial purpose. And that is in essence my bill. And I would love to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Council Member Stiles, for joining us. Does anyone have any questions for Council Member Stiles? Ms. Ross. Council Member, how are you tonight? Hello, my dear. How are you? Okay. Uh, who will be funding this bill? I'm glad that you asked, Brenda. So, right now, I have two companies that are willing to donate the cameras for six months. There is no financial cost to the taxpayer at all on the front end nor the back end. And the way my bill is set up, at the end of the, you know, when we do the review of the data at, at 150 days, we can make the determination if, if this is successful, then we could extend it by resolution. Or if it's, if it's going well, we could talk about what could that look like if we were to expand the use of LPRs um, once it had been determined the safety of the system. Is that good, ma'am? Yes, thank you very much. You are so welcome. It's good to hear your voice. Thank you, Ms. Ross. As a follow up to that, I don't know if I heard the names of the two companies that were um, offering to provide it. Yes, um, one is Vigilant and the other is a safer Nashville. So Vigilant is the, they actually have LPRs that are being used in a few different places here in the city, particularly Opry Mills has been using them to crack down on a lot of the crime that has been taking place in the parking lot as well as on property. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the shooting that took place at Opry Mills. The LPRs were installed right after that and uh, apparently have been working very well. Uh, a Safer Nashville is a nonprofit that was created to be able to help MNPD with with needs since they are understaffed and so this was a concern and so they have said well we'll take care of the cameras for those six months thank you um, you're welcome mr campbell gooch i think you were next yeah i saw that board member ross raised her hand before mine so i just wanted to hold space uh before i went okay miss ross Yes, Council Lady, has it been determined what part of town that this pilot program will be? Will it just be one part of town or several areas in town? 
it will be several areas, and thank you for the question. The point of the pilot is to show us how this can be effective throughout the entire city. Um, it is not geared towards any particular group of individuals. Um, the designated places will be determined by where we've seen a lot of the activity in regards to the, the reckless driving. So I'm sure many of you are aware there have been drag racing stings that have been happening over the last few weekends. So this would help with that effort. As you know, it's dangerous for our officers to go and pursue people in a high-speed chase. So we've been utilizing helicopters um, to assist with that, but having the LPRs would help as well to be able to capture some of the people that are fleeing the scene and capture their data. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I have a couple questions, but um, the first one is just like, um, I think council member, you just said something about like the activity or like they'll be placed in communities where this specific particular behavior is happening. So I'm just curious when those communities be similar in design. And the reason that I'm asking is because don't the streets have to be designed a very specific way in order to allow any type of racing? No, uh, unfortunately, uh, if that were the case, I think we, we'd be seeing less of what we are experiencing now. We have cars racing on, on back roads, on main thoroughfares, all over town. And, and uh, nice, nice to meet you, I should say, uh, verbally. I can't see you. Oh, nice to uh, nice to meet you too. Uh, I'm like I'm excited about this conversation uh, that we're having, and I'm and I'm excited that the community oversight board is also being um, used in this way, especially when it comes to how these things are both going to affect our community. So, are does and this is sorry for the lack of information I have, but does MMPD already have a um, essentially like a list of things that uh, drivers that they already think is drag racing and will the software be used to kind of alert when those people are in the area? Actually, no, the, there is no uh, aforementioned data at all. What they've been doing in regards to the stings, they've actually been using social media and kind of seeing where there's activity across the city and heading to those locations and trying to cut the activity off before it begins. So they don't know of anyone in particular in advance. Oh, thank you for that. And then I just have like a statement, I mean, a question and then a statement. Um, and then my last question is like, I, you mentioned how um, these license plates readers are already being used um, in other areas across the city. I know Bell Me was one of them. I know you mentioned um, Opry Mills Mall. Do you know of any examples we can point to um, where these license plate readers are used to deter drag racing specifically? So my bill um, would, would be the first time that it would be in use for that purpose, but the equipment is designed to do just that. It is designed to track speed as well as use the license plate reader technology. And other cities could use it for that purpose. They just choose not to. And any system that implements LPRs determines how they're used. And so for policy, we could say, well, we're only going to use the LPRs for speeding, or we're only going to use them for um, catching car thieves, or perhaps um, there's someone who's wanted uh, for another crime out of state and they come through our system. All of that can be in the policy and be set. But no, this would, this would be the first time that we'd be able to utilize it in this way. And I, I have chosen this way because we do have a problem across the city, but also because it has a very narrow focus and I want to help make people feel comfortable with the system and also the audit system that's built in. You cannot enter information into the system without it flagging. And there are actually companies that have a two-step authenticator system asking, um, why are you inputting this information? 
if this is tied to a case, what is the case number? Or you have to enter the information and then your request gets sent to a supervisor for it to be approved. And there is a trail for every single activity that is done by anyone that has access. For example, Bell Meads Police Department, there are only five people on staff that can enter information from a license plate into the system. That Those are four dispatchers and one detective. And so if anything is being entered, it'll, it'll ping the system and it will let other people know that there's a, a weird activity taking place and it can lead to someone being terminated. So there, there's a fear built in um, by anyone trying to use this system for uh, devious practices. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for um, that wealth of information um, that you just laid in. And thank you for um, coming here and speaking to us and answering my questions um, so honestly. You're welcome. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention, this is extremely um, concerning for for me, uh, being a person who has always been surveilled, uh, both growing up very close to MDHA properties in North Nashville, also having those uh, police towers um, in my grocery store parking lots, my family dollar parking lots, and like, constantly being surveilled. I just want a whole space for people who don't um, feel comfortable with the prevalence of surveillance and um, the invitation of surveillance as a way to further criminalize us. So I know that there's an issue, but I just want to hold space for people who are also like deeply afraid that this is going to lead to the further harming of poor people who move throughout the city. So I just wanted to mention that. And I don't, and I don't think that that's your intention, Council Member. I'm not trying to give you anything against you. I just want to hold space for those that I'm literally sent here and placed on this board uh, to represent. And I appreciate your perspective, which is exactly why I've proposed the pilot program. Initially, my, uh, my intention was for it to be a regular ordinance. I feel that doing this with a, as a pilot program we have the opportunity to share how this particular system can and cannot be used. As I was saying, you cannot use this system to say, oh, I have a crush on my neighbor, let me go to work as a police officer and put their license plate in and try and dig up their information. That could be grounds for dismissal. And it's also not a, an effective use of the tool either. Um, it's because of all the fail safes that are put in there. When you're gonna, you know, you'd be asked about what cases this pertain to. Well, there's no case if you just have a crush on someone. This is you inappropriately using the system, which is going to flag and it's going to bring attention um, to unscrupulous behavior. So I do understand the concern, but I think with this particular system, that is not a concern that you need to have. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to extend an invitation. Um, I'm planning on, on putting a group together to go and take a look at the Mount Juliet system so that you can see how the system is audited and what you can and cannot do. And I think that's the best way for people to understand what this system does and does not do. So please let me know if you're interested um, and I will include you when I do that invitation. Thank you, Council Member Stiles. Um, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Sweeney, you're yeah, sorry, sorry, unmuting. Um, are there going to be um, written policies as far as how this gets administered? And if so, what's the status of them and who's going to draft them? So thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Sweeney. And the answer is yes. Very, very clear policy. As Right now, I'm trying to get it passed so that we can utilize this technology. But in my bill currently, it says what it can and cannot be used for. Um, as we move forward and talking about just having the trial, um, what I would like to do and have discussed, I, I'd like to give access to someone from community oversight to be able to view how the audit system works. I do want to put that in writing, um, as well as having one or two people from council that are also able to go in there and look and see how the system works and does not work. And it, that is in, it is tracking in real time. And I think the best way for people to learn about a system 
is for it to be very explicitly written out. And so that is in that is in my mind already and in, in drafting that policy. And who's going to whose policy is it going to be? Is this going to be it would be it would be council departments? Is this going to be the DAs? Is this going to be the councils? It would be council. I mean, it, it, is that typical of council? I just don't remember policies in that regard. And and should it be police department policy since they're going to be the ones who are going to be using this? <laughs> As I've been speaking um, with Chief Drake and, and what this would and what this would look like, um, I'm more than happy to ask that question. But I I believe that we are able to put some put legislation together about because it is a pilot and because it is what we're proposing and as to what can be done with the software. Okay, um, I, I I can't speak for the board, but based upon earlier discussions that we've had, I think that the board would like to have input in the policies before they're adopted by whomever is going to adopt them if we, if we could. Okay, uh, I, am, I am very open to that. Um, what, what is vitally important to me and why I'm here and why I reached out to you in the first place is that there has to be uh, a, a level of comfort moving forward not only with the police and council but also with this board and your support is important to me i do not want you to feel that that your opinion does not matter or have value so I'm more than happy to broach that thank you we we appreciate that and um equally we obviously support um, the, the council as it goes through matters like this, what we've experienced over the two years of our existence, um, frankly, is that we tend to be thought of, if we're thought of, late. I know. After, after the fact, after people have already decided what they wish to do or, or, or want to do. And what what we strive for and have been striving for over the last two years is to um, get a voice early on and and to advance community voices at the same time and and that both that involvement at the beginning and our opportunity to kind of um, influence persuade um, as to what it might look like uh, we think is important because of how we were formed and what the community has asked us to do. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Thank uh, you. Ms. Ross. Okay. Um, I clearly understand what your bill is trying to do. But right behind your bill comes Bill 2020-581 that's asking for license plate scanners technology to put on or within law enforcement vehicles. Can you tell, I mean, I know you're not on the bill, but can you tell me what your thoughts are behind that bill or do we need to direct it to the people who are? I can tell you the difference between my bill and their bill. Um, again, my bill is now tailored to assuaging people's concerns regarding privacy and surveillance to addressing the reckless driving behaviors that we're seeing. So hence the pilot program for six months. That bill has been designed to roll out the use of LPRs in a very broad way, where well, mine is narrow, they would like to use LPRs for a variety of different things. So um, car theft, uh, Amber Alerts, wanted people. I, I think I, I, I disagree with the bill because I don't think the entire community is ready for a full rollout of cameras across the city. I think people need to be comfortable or at least see how a system works first before a decision is made. 
And so that is why I put my bill forth and I made it as narrow as it was to begin with. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Sweeney, I see your hand up. Just not sure if you didn't unraise it. Any other questions for uh, Council Member Stiles? Excuse me, uh, Chair. I think I had my hand raised. I wanted to go ahead and opportunity to speak. Sure, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Hughes. Uh, Councilwoman Stiles, thank you so much once again for being here uh, today and for, for presenting the details of your bill. We appreciate, uh, as I'd like to reiterate what was stated earlier, uh, several of the board members have already stated it, but uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be involved uh, in preparation of, of uh, policies. We really appreciate you making the effort to include us as it is being developed and planned out. Um, I did have a question uh, specifically about how the data that will be collected will be stored. I know that that may be something that will be handled by the provider, uh, but I was curious about, uh, you mentioned in, a little bit earlier, who would have access to the information and how quickly would we receive as members of the board uh, the same access or around the same time the access that NMPD would have uh, the information? Would it be provided also to the purveyor or the person who is controlling or creating uh, the infrastructure of maintaining the machines? Could you just kind of give some clarity around what happens with the data and how it will be stored? In the First of all, hello, sir. Good to hear your voice, although I will tell you, you sound very, very far away. But I, I did hear your question. So in regards to data, the way this would work, the equipment would be donated. It would be um, attached to the MNPD IT system so that officers would be able to use it. MNPD would, would have the access, those you know few people that would be able to follow up on any leads that came in um, from the hot list. And again, that would only be a handful of people. The people that would have access, so the auxiliary people I was referring to, so maybe a couple of council members, perhaps someone on the COB, you'd be able to go in in a read-only status just because none of us as civilians have access to a crime database. But you'd be able to go in and see in real time how people are using the system. Um, it shows you what time they check in, what they've done in the system, how long they've been logged into the system. And, and there's, there's you know screenshots of what's taking place. So the non-offender data that comes in, no one ever touches it and it is deleted as in it never existed after 30 days. It is not stored someplace. It's not available to be misused. Did that answer your question? I heard. It, it did indeed. Thank, you. Oh, that was so much thank better. you so much for, you thank you. you so much for that clarity. I appreciate it. And we appreciate you once again um, uh, being allowing us to be a part of this conversation. We appreciate having these discussions, and thank you so much for uh, for being available for us today. Well, it was my pleasure um, not only to be here but to engage you um, as we as we talk about policy moving forward. We have to be mindful that that there are people that have a different perspective of you know wanting to combat crime. How does that make certain communities feel? And if we're not taking all of these perspectives in account, then we're not really doing our jobs effectively or fairly. So I appreciate the opportunity to further explain the bill. And, and I welcome, if there are any more questions, if someone thinks of something after this call is over, please feel free to email me or call me. Brenda and Timothy have my phone number. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Stiles. Any other questions for Council Member? If not, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I I, I hope um, that after after deliberation that you would be interested in supporting my bill. I I would appreciate it. Thank you so very much. I hope you all have. Uh, wonderful holiday season. It is finally upon us and 2020 is almost over. So take care.
Thank you very much, Council Member Stiles. You too. Let's move on to our next guest. You know, I think he's been on the line the whole time. Um, Mr. Arnold Hayes, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mr. Hayes. I, well, a few of us, or many of us, read your uh, editorial in the Tennessean last week, and we thought it'd be a great idea to invite you to uh, speak about your ideas, uh, specifically, you know, regarding the Policing Policy Commission and, and the COB in general. So, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and I, would, I, would, I would like to thank. Um, First of all, the, the Metropolitan Nashville Community Oversight Board and their staff uh, for having me as one of your uh, speakers uh, at today's meeting. Uh, in my opinion, the COB uh, is hands down one of the most important boards in Nashville because it represents one of the best hopes for making meaningful improvements in public safety, not just for some, but for all of Nashville. The COB board was a bottom-up effort that came from the cries of people that are most affected by officer misconduct, and they demanded change. During my address, I would like to convey just my overall opinion of the Policing Policy Commission report and briefly comment on the commission report's recommendations related to the COB. The Policing Policy Commission, as directed by Mayor Cooper, takes the opposite approach from the way that the COB was established. But to be clear, the Policing, Pol uh, Policing Policy Commission did a reasonable job in following Mayor Cooper's directives and capturing his limited vision. The commission is to be commended for meeting Mayor Cooper's objective. That being said, the Commission's paternalistic, top-down approach produced no measurables in the report to track progress and disregard perceived systemic problems within MMPD like racism and sexism. These low-hanging fruit recommendations will not move the needle. The mayor was said to follow the former President Barack Obama's pledge that called for cities to reform use of force policies, redefine public safety, and combat systemic racism inside local law enforcement agencies. The 42-person commission, consisting of prominent local, astute politicos and advocates, were divided into three committees, communities, workforce, and policy. Relating released its final report on November 20th. The report ignores the crises that happened in Nashville, including the killing of Jacques Clemens and the killing of Daniel Hambrick. Also allegations of sexual harassment and sexual violence within MMPD but goes out of its way to praise law enforcement. My hope was for an in-depth investigation by the commission into police accountability and systemic racism. The commission failed to examine one of the key Obama pledge aspects, combating the kind of systemic racism that was identified in Gideon's Army 2000 driving while black stood. Why wasn't the commission directed to address systemic race, the systemic racism piece? Mayor Cooper knows that answer. But if given similar resources and access to data, as the commission was, the police policy commission was, they're grassroots advocates that are more than capable of working on this particular issue. If Mayor Cooper 
is serious about improving public safety, then he should create a localized version of the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act of 2020. Having had extensive experience in the corporate sector, proposals for training and dialogue are often used as delay tactics to give the perception of doing something. In my opinion, diversity training can only go so far. Retaining overly aggressive racist, sexist, or homophobic officers isn't a training issue, but a disciplinary problem. How many people in the who's who of Nashville Commission have even been on the receiving end of officer misconduct? I submit to you that there are only a few. How many feel the tension and fear instead of calm when blue lights are flashing approaching as, as one is driving. My answer is the same. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from the Birmingham jail confronted moderate whites that would set a timetable for blacks taking direct action to end segregation. The moderate says, obey the law but they are not the victims of police brutality. The privilege says, be patient, but protesting doesn't mean, de mean death for them. I submit to you that King would also view the policing policy report with apprehension and would insist on the most effective voices being heard in order for meaningful change to be realized. The commission's conclusions failing to deliver was expected, usually with a top-down management approach. A perceived problem is solved by appointing a task force stacked with the majority of members that agree with one's position to ensure an acceptable management answer. Mayor Cooper's approach with the Police and Policy Commission is a classic example of this thinking. It's the opposite of, a, of the successful bottom-up grassroots efforts like the Driving While Black report and the 2018 Amendment 1 COB referendum that resulted in the COB. But even with its flaws, the effort should present well in Mayor Cooper's 2021 State of Nashville address. Yet the report is, in King's words, justice delayed being justice denied. And now I'd like to just briefly give my take on the commission's recommendations that involves the community oversight board. The recommendations, first of all, are reasonable, but the language needs to be stronger. For example, words like cooperate, consult, and support should be replaced with mandates Please correct me if I'm wrong. The Community Oversight Board is a department that is a department within the Metropolitan Nashville government. Since that is the case, the COB deserves the same cooperation with MMPD as Metro Schools, the Metro Council, or the District Attorney's Office. Just the fact that one of the recommendations in the, in the, uh, is that MNPD cooperate with the COB calls into question the respectability of this board. And that was overwhelmingly established by the people. Besides including mandatory language, the recommendations need to become legislation and or police policy. Also, if Nashville is to follow former President Obama's pledge, in addition to working toward the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020, why not look into ways Nashville can prohibit racial, religious, 
and discriminatory profiling in law enforcement? How about mandating racial bias training? for MMPD rather than recommending diversity training. As I said, diversity training can only go so far. How about reviewing and mandating any needed changes to MMPD's de-escalation policy? How about developing a police misconduct registry for Nashville? Again, in my opinion, the recommendations are sound if you include stronger language, but they are still low hanging fruit. Thank you for allowing me to address your board on the important topic of public safety for all of Nashville, those with and without political and economic access. Just like the need to listen to the experts for those who are affected by COVID-19, we need to do likewise when it comes to officer misconduct. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. Um, I wonder if you have time to stay with us to, if, in case any board members have any questions. I do. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, if there are any questions for Mr. Hayes. I'll um, ask. But do you, how would you recommend that we go about, you know, forming our own way, forming our own, I mean, not policing policy commission, but you know, picking up where the policing policy commission may have left off, uh, making it stronger, like you said? In my opinion, uh, I don't know whether it would come from the mayor uh, or not, but that particular piece concerning uh, the race piece, uh, again, it, it seems like that piece for some reason was ignored. And to me, that's one of the most important aspects of trying to improve policing in Nashville, because uh, if, you, if you address the race piece, you also address the, 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 the harassment piece or the homophobic piece. There are so many issues that 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 encompasses. So that to me, that would be one area uh, that still should should be worked on. And I would recommend that uh, instead of trying the top down approach, that we do something similar to uh, the successful uh, 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 efforts that I mentioned, of where you know the people determine who needs to be on that particular task force or commission, and then they come and make recommendations. Uh, but again, to me, it would be that race piece, because I think that was, uh, uh, that's the high hanging fruit. That's not the low hanging fruit. That's, 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 that's the more difficult one. I, uh, uh, and that's why that's being focused on all over the country. And it's, it's one that's not going away. We either have to address it, it's not going away. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch, do you have a question? Yes. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Hayes. Um, I noticed in your article you talked about you talk about this is the current climate that calls for us to take offense. Can you talk about uh, what that means? Because I mean, as a as a community member, like I'm offended a lot a lot of the times by um, certain things. I mean, especially um, the fact that there was real there's really there was really no vision um, mm -hmm. happening and no leadership in a time when we need the most leadership. Um, you know, unwillingness to expand our ideas around what institutions make us actually feel safe. So I'm just curious if you could talk about like why as community members we should be offended um, at this point in time. Uh, I think you ought to be offended because uh, when, when something affects one person, it affects everyone, uh, whether you want to realize it or not. And I guess 
being a part of actually uh, com being a part of community oversight now and pushing for this referendum and and really being on the ground and and seeing the faces of people that actually lost loved ones like like Jacque Clemens or, or or Daniel Hambrick and and just seeing just the the people just how 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 committed they are to in spite of that that they want to get something done and 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 and, and for uh, and even though I have a, a lot of empathy for uh, people like George Floyd, uh, I, I have a lot of empathy. And that happened outside of Nashville, but it was almost like we don't have those problems in Nashville. But my my answer is yes, you do. And so it was it was offensive. Uh, it was offensive that uh, that it was almost like those things never happen. Those things never happen, and we continually have things happen in Nashville. And even I mentioned about the, the allegations of sexual harassment and 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 uh, those allegations. And so, yes, uh, I, I don't know if I I think I kind of rambled a little bit there, uh, but but yeah, I think everyone needs to be offended because if we're going to make a, improvements, and I'll get back to what Dr. King said uh, concerning the moderates. Uh, even if you're not the ones affected, uh, you may be affected by something else tomorrow, even though I'm affected by it today. Today it may be an African-American, but tomorrow or, or this afternoon, it's a woman that's being affected or the LGBTQ community is being affected. So we're all in this together. And I think if nothing else, COVID has shown us that we are all in this together. So uh, I hope I answered your question. I tried. <laughs> Thank you for that. You did. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. You're welcome. Other board members have any questions for Mr. Hayes? not thank you so much for joining us i know this probably won't be the last time that we uh engage you seek your advice uh on these issues are very important and i'm really glad that you wrote that opinion piece uh to to voice that concern um and i really want to amplify that and, and make sure that we're on the right track here in nashville and again, I want to thank you all for having me, and and uh, I really do uh, have a lot of respect for this board. Uh, you know, I've been pleased with you know a lot of the the efforts that you all have made, and also getting the MOU, you know, approved and everything. So uh, I'll just say, keep up the good work, Nashville. Uh, the people on the ground are depending on you because uh, we definitely need a long long standing change. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Were there any other questions on the executive director's report? I know we had to cut that a bit short. And if not, uh, Director Patrick, was there anything that you wanted to add before public comment? No, I think that I've said all that I wanted to say regarding the executive or director's report. Okay, I'm not sure if we have uh, any public comment for this meeting. None is coming yet. All right, um, I think we can move on to new business announcements. Mr. Sweeney. Yes, um, my term on the board um, is going to end next month, and um, I'm not going to seek re-election. At the end of next year, I'm going to retire from my law practice, so I'm not making any new long-term commitments. Um, I appreciate having had the opportunity to work with each of you 
Um, Nashville is very, very fortunate um, to have such a dedicated agency as the Community Oversight Board and the MNCO uh, with an active involved board and a highly professional staff. Um, the, the board was really very, very well conceived um, by the community members and the community organizations that pushed for its creation. And I think the COB is well on its way to, to exercising the influence and the effective oversight that, that the community demands. Um, I, I trust that the COB will, will stay this course and, and become even more aggressive. I'm, I'm very, very proud to have served on the board and to have had the opportunity to serve on the board. And I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity for that and, and for allowing me um, to play this, this uh, my own small part um, in, in making this community better through this organization. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Sweeney. I think you said small part, but uh, you played a really big part in forming this board. I know from sitting in Metro room, Metro meeting rooms, writing bylaws on Friday evenings. Uh, you were there from the beginning. So thank you, thank you so much for all the work you've done here. Any other new business? Yeah, I think Mr. Um, Legal Advisor Pinkley has some new business to talk about. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a, a hand raise button for me. Uh, I've got a couple of things real quick before we can adjourn. Um, the COB roll-offs, uh, the announcement has not yet been finalized for new board members, uh, but the Metro clerk anticipates that the vacancy will be announced at the next council meeting, which is scheduled for January 5th. Uh, if that is the actual announcement date, uh, then the elections for new board members will be held uh, mid to late February. Uh, the, the exact dates for that will be determined by the vice mayor and that will be included in the announcement when it's finalized. Uh, and all that information will be added to the COB's webpage. Um, current board members do have the ability to stay on uh, for up to 60 days past the end of their term uh, if a replacement hasn't been named. Uh, so that should resolve any issues if we have to go into, into February um, for, for new board members. Uh, also under our rules, uh, section 13 requires an annual review of our rules. Uh, I think with Mr. Sweeney's term ending, it might be a good idea to have that review sometime in January uh, since he was the mastermind behind those rules uh, to kind of have a review and make sure our rules are working the way we want them to work. And we may also want to uh, check the bylaws as well to make sure that those are still functioning the way we want them to function. And if there's anywhere for improvement, we can address that. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Um, yes, let's make sure to schedule a meeting of the Rules Committee sometime after maybe the second week of January, if everyone's back by then. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I want to say thank you uh, to Mr. Sweeney and just kind of echo the chair's remarks. Also, I'm having this. I'm having community members reach out to me saying that they are on the phone and they want to have uh, time for a public statement. I'm not sure how I can uh, bump that up. And then, um, yeah, so I wanted to put that here because it feels like we're about to adjourn, but I think some of them are wanting to speak and they're on the phone right now. Thank you, Mr. Kamalgooch. Is there a way to know what's the procedure here? I'm how can they indicate that they're the ones or if you can see the phone numbers at the bottom of the screen um so to you, we would need their the, we would need the first um we would need the their first digits of their telephone number um and then i'm not sure if they're calling in whether or not they can be bumped over to participants so Mr. Um, Mr. Pinkley, do you know if that can happen? 
if, with, the, with them calling in on the public line? So the best I can do with calling in on the public line is to unmute them uh, to allow them to speak, uh, but I would need to know their uh, uh, three-digit prefix for their number. Uh, I can only see the area code in the first three digits. Uh, Ch Chair, I have the information. I didn't want to speak on the wrong. No, sure. Go ahead. Uh, it's 615-260. And then, of course, to keep in line with what our procedures are, I think we have a, is it a three, a two or three minute limitation on the comments? I think it's a three minute limit. Okay. I believe the person has been unmuted. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank Hi. you for joining us. Uh, we'll give you Three minutes, if you want to say your name, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for making that work. I wasn't sure. This is Nora Kern. I'm the executive director of Walk Bike Nashville. And I did just want to comment briefly on the license plate um, readers, and I will keep it very brief. Um, just a couple things that we've been discussing in the transportation um, sector that we wanted to kind of share with you um, and pose for thoughts. Um, first of all, we just want to highlight how important addressing speeding is in our city. Um, we advocate for safe streets and no speeding is a really high priority or one of the leading cause of crashes. Um, but we are also really looking to reframe how these um, types of transportation issues are addressed in our, in our city. And I um, want to highlight that while enforcement can be a solution, there are also other solutions we hope um, this committee will will consider and and also push for as they consider um, council member Stiles' bill. Um, one thing that I think um, Mr. Kimball Gooch mentioned earlier is the role that infrastructure can play. And so, as the city considers making this sort of investment, we should also consider a potential alternative investment to making it impossible to speed on our streets. So. Um, if, if the concern is drag racing, um, several speed bumps will be much cheaper than, um, you know, many, many man hours of, of um, police time and will be a more permanent solution um, that doesn't require surveillance um, or some of the other downsides. Um, and then we also did want to highlight that in some other cities, um, one example we know, um, have personal experience with in New York City, um, these types of devices are actually um, managed by the transportation department, not by the police department. So as you guys consider um, your position on the license plate scanners, um, we would love to um, be part of that conversation as, as we can as transportation experts, um, but also just want to highlight that there might be other solutions that should be considered at the same time besides a pure enforcement approach. So thank you so much for taking the time at the end of the meeting. I appreciate being able to speak. Thanks for calling in, Nora. Thanks for those comments. Um, I don't know if you know any, if anyone else who was waiting. Um, you know, Mr. Kamalgooch? Yeah, I think um, two more people just reached out to me, but I think they might have sent in a recording. They're not sure if it's working. I think they're having like, technical difficulties. So um, that's those are the last two that I think we're trying to get. Okay. I don't know if there's a way to check the recordings now or... Yeah, we don't have any recordings. So if they want to speak now, we can just um, move them up and unmute them. All right. Yeah, that was um, the community um, liaison, Ms. Thompson. She said we don't have any recordings, and so the best way is for um, each person to be unmuted and just um, speak um, when and give their um, telephone information. Is there a way? I'm not sure if we're able to identify 
which one of these numbers we should be in muting. Yeah, like, um, I'm not, I don't think they're on the phone anymore. So okay. uh, my suggestion is that we just kind of uh, move on. I think uh, from the messages that I'm getting, that people seem to be very curious about this uh, license plate reader um, bill that is going through a city council right now. Um, I also, and this was my announcement, I wanted to say, like, I created, like, a couple of resources that I have found, like, very informative around um, the license plate readers and how they're being used uh, across the country with, like, studies and data and all of that stuff. Um, I sent it to Executive Director Jill. I just wanted to, I mean, Executive Director Fitcher, I just wanted to know if other board members would like to see that as well. And we could make that happen. Sure, I, I think Director Richard could send that to the board. Yeah, sure thing. And we're having a community conversation tomorrow. Um, Councilmember Jennifer Gamble has put together three community conversations. One starts tomorrow, uh, and then there's two in January. Um, and she will have guests on each panel. Um, so tomorrow it would be myself. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's either um, Captain Gilder or Chief Drake, as well as a um, research um, person who is going to be on all three panels from Vanderbilt talking about the, the, the um, license plate readers and his research. Um, the second one in, in January is going to have some CJ stakeholders. It'll be the DA's office. It'll be the public defender, um, as well as Brandon Tucker from the ACLU and two community members. And then the last one will be um, Mel Fowler Green from the uh, Human Rights Commission. Um, and I think there will also be a couple community members on that particular panel as well. I'm not sure if there's any community people on the on the panel tomorrow, but um, the, they start. It starts at five o'clock, five from, from five to six thirty, I believe, and it's going to be broadcast on MNN. Thank you, Director Pitchard. Uh, Mr. Sweeney, I see your hand up. Just not sure if you had raised it or not. Thank you. Uh, any other new business? I guess that's where we're at. Ms. Ross. I'd just like to wish everybody a happy holidays and ask everybody to say, stay safe and mass up. Very good advice, Ms. Ross. Um, if that's it, I think that's a good note to end on. If anyone wants to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, this is board member Witzel, so move. Thank you, Mr. Witzel. Is there a second? Is there a second? Board member Hughes here. Uh, I'd like to second. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. I'll do a uh, roll call vote here. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Davis. No, you had joined us or not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Goddard. Mr. Goddard. Still can't hear you if you're, I saw you and I, there you are. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And Mr. Witzel. Aye. No, I vote as well. Thank you so much everyone for this year and I hope you have a safe holiday, like uh, Ms. Ross said, and mask up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a happy holiday. Happy holidays.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.